Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I see. I mean, if he if he kills a person, the person is an arhat, but he doesn't know that he's an ar- he's an arhat. No, because it's impossible for him to kill any arhat. Yeah. So does that mean Tom is totally to kill anyone who is an arhat, even if he doesn't know that person? Oh, another related question. Okay, so these are two questions. Okay, so the first question seems, is it possible for him to kill an arahant? Well, actually, the broader question is, will he kill anybody at all intentionally? And my understanding is that I haven't come across in the text anything that says that it's impossible for a stream, for a person with right view, a stream enterer, that it's impossible for them to kill any human being at all. But what is said is that the person who has the right view follows or um, conforms or accords with those virtues which are dear to the noble ones without any breach or blemish. And so the virtues that are dear to the noble ones would probably be at least the four major precepts. Not to take life, not to steal, not to commit sexual misconduct, not to tell, not to speak falsely. Um, Now it seems that, that it's not said that such a person is incapable of taking life. But it seems to me that a person who has the right view will not kill another human being. And I think the reason why it's not said that such a person is incapable of taking life, because the person, suppose he's reborn as a human being, maybe a little, as a little boy before he comes to become acquainted with the Dhamma, maybe, just possible, maybe playfully he'll kill insects. But I just don't think that kill another human being. I think that would be impossible, in my understanding. Yeah, the way it's explained, it's not explained within the sutta itself, but the commentary says that this particular case is singled out in order to show how blameworthy or unreliable the state of a worldling is, that a worldling is incapable that a worldling is capable even of killing his mother or father, whereas a person with the right view, a noble one, is incapable of killing his mother and father. But it seems to me that somebody who has, as I said, reached the stage of stream entry just would not kill another human being. And I don't know any you know, incidents mentioned in the text which speak about a noble one killing another human being. <laughs> Accidentally kill an arhat? <laughs> I just don't know any passage in the text which speaks about that. but. Just my own personal assumption would be somehow that there would be something that would prevent him from doing that, even accidentally. Something but an arahant did kill an arahant in the sutras. Arahant commits suicide. Those are different cases. That's a different case. Couple questions from the internet. Yeah.
Yeah, I think he would be sort of protected from that, just a person with right view. It just wouldn't happen. You know this, the case of Oedip- Oedipus? Oedipus Rex, so he... At his birth, it's predicted that, you know, by a prophet, that he's going to kill his father and marry his mother. And so his parents abandon him someplace, like in the middle of a desert, thinking that he'll just die in that way. But then some travelers come through, they pick him up, they see, they see the baby, they pick him up, they nurture him, they adopt him, bring him up. Then when he reaches maturity, later in life, while he's traveling someplace, he comes across a man on the road, and he kills that, he gets into a quarrel with that man, kills him, it turns out that that man is his father, though he doesn't know about it at the time. Then he travels further, he comes to another city, he meets a woman a bit older than himself, (laughs) falls in love with her and marries, or maybe it's a marriage of convenience. Anyway, he... Excuse me? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets the, the woman, the queen. And the queen, it turns out, is his mother. And so in that way, he fulfilled the prophecy. The prophecy. But I don't think that would happen to a person, a stream enter. No, it's, I got it. Okay, somebody says, if it's impossible to have two Buddhas in the same world system, why are there so many Buddhas that appear together in sutras like the Lotus Sutra, Avatangsaka Sutra, or Amitabha Sutra? I mean, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think first what's said is that those sutras, these are the Mahayana Sutras, are speaking about different, on the whole, they're speaking about different world systems. So in this case, they're taking world systems which are said to be in number, like the sands of the river Ganges. And so in these different world systems throughout the universe, you know, in principle, at the same time, there can be Buddhas. But in this world, the world of sort of under the reign or under the spiritual supervision of Gautama Buddha, there's not another Buddha arising at the same time. So in the Lotus Sutra, a Buddha from the past, distant past, sort of appears, how do you call this? Vashan? It's like a transformation body. He appears and he applauds the Buddha for teaching the Lotus Sutra, and then they have a conversation. So you can say that these sutras, they're not trying, I think that they're not to be taken literally as saying that two Buddhas are actually living and teaching in the same world system. But rather this is sort of an imaginative development in order to bring in what is called to look at perspectives or to look at things from a spiritual perspective rather than from the historical, factual perspective. So one has to understand these from coming from different perspectives. Okay, the next question. In late period Buddhism, non-duality asserts that impossible or possible are really the same. Is non-duality really a Buddhist teaching at all? Non-duality ideas basically rejected the ideas in Vipalasa, Madhyamaka, or or this is non-duality says samsara is no different from nirvana. I think the question should be related to the sutta that we're discussing. I don't want to go off into tangential topics, so we'll just put these aside for now. <laughs> you have a wide audience, my 
Any other questions? Comments? I, yeah. The meaning, yeah. according to the sutta. It said that datu, let's see, they give, the suttas themselves don't give a definition of datu. They just enumerate different types of datu. But it's in the commentaries that one gets an etymological definition of the word datu. And what they say, I think it goes something like, atano sabhavam dharetiti datu. So, Dharati, it supports or maintains its own nature. Therefore, it is called Datu. But that really seems to apply more to Datu in the sense of the 18 elements or the six elements, things that have their own nature. I don't know that the commentary would apply that to Datu in the meaning of the realm of existence. So it's a a little bit problematic to me how the word datu comes to take on these two two nuances. You also have this in the Chinese, because the Chinese just translate it as jie. And then they use it in those different senses. So we have... um, Yu jie, se jie, wu se jie, right? For the three realms. And then also you have jie used for the di jie, shui jie, huo jie, feng jie. <laughs> And Kongjie, right? And Shijie. Right. Yeah. And for example, today, uh, you know, like seeing the elements, the six kinds, the sensual desire, the renunciation, yeah. as well as ill will, non ill will, cruelty, yeah. non cruelty. Yeah. So, what at least, you know, the, this, the, it's the way it's translated, when he knows and sees these yeah. Yeah, yeah. people who can be caught skilled in elements, yeah, yeah this is, yeah. yeah. It, it Yeah. Those three defilements within oneself, yeah. Yeah. in itself, yeah. is a purifying, it's a wholesome 
Yeah. Convict, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is this So my question is actually by that itself. Yeah. It has the the solution somehow comes out, you just have to know it when it's yeah. in it. Yeah. In you. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were driving at something else which struck me when you started to quest the question and it triggered a thought in my mind that it seems like there's some difference in these <coughs> topics that are to be inquired into or investigated in the sutta that the first sets, as you said, are like objects of contemplation or actual practices So these are like things you, you could practice, like observing, contemplating the 18 elements, the six elements, the different feelings, you know, pleasure, joy, pain, sorrow, and equanimity, even ignorance. And then the three wholesome thoughts, three unwholesome thoughts. And then, of course, the six internal and external bases, which actually come in the Satipatthana Sutta itself. And, of course, dependent origination, you know, with somebody with advanced wisdom could contemplate that. But then when we come to the things that are possible and impossible, it seems like this is outside the sphere of actual personal observation. But these are things which are they're said by the Buddha, and then either one believes them or disbelieves them. But I don't see how one could know and see these for oneself. I thought that you were pushing at that distinction. But that seems to be a, a real distinction. And it... <laughs> Dina, you look like you are going to make a comment. Well, I'm the elephant in the room. Go ahead. I'm still really upset. We give, <laughs> we give, we give room to, we accommodate in this room, whether they're, whether they're mosquitoes or elephants, all of them are welcome. <laughs> mosquitoes, tigers, elephants. So let the elephant... No, say whatever you want. Well, I mean, if we go back and look at the Buddha's behavior before he becomes enlightened, right? no, let's not do that. Let's just talk about the enlightened one. Yeah. The truly enlightened one. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm right where I left off before lunch. If you're truly enlightened, then how can you not see men and women? Yeah. I understand that men are superior to women in one way. You have physical power. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, intellectually, if you look at us in school, we are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and we're better than you until we discover you don't like us, Mark. And then we kind of dumb down. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 there's it's truth in it. Actually, I've never seen that. I've never seen that in any of the early Buddhist, Buddhist, early Buddhist texts. This comes to be a popular belief in. Okay, I don't even know. But I don't know the yeah. stuff, so I'm just saying. Uh, no, they how say. Well, I'm not en enlightened in the sense of well, realization. I Yeah. Yeah. and advancing the cause and getting education for us and yeah. making our lives better and yeah. uh, whatever. All of that good stuff. Now, if we, a regular human being, of course, extra smart like you, can realize that women are terrific, yeah. how did the Buddha not see this? And this disturbs me. I don't see, I don't, 
I don't think that this passage indicates that the Buddha didn't see that or that he made some biased discrimination against women. I think, again, two, three things I can say. First is the possibility that these passages are interpolations. Possibility. I I'm not... Buy that. Excuse me? I can buy that. Yeah, I mean, this would be the sphere for somebody who does, you know, extensive critical scholarship in the text. And then maybe even they can't come to a definite conclusion, only, you know, conjectures. So that's one possibility. The other way to understand this is the one that I think is most reasonable. <coughs> to say that it emerges from the cultural and so social matrix of ancient India, and which was at least the model that prevailed throughout most of the world, which is the one where the people in positions of authority are the males. And it doesn't mean the male is superior in terms of capacities, intelligence, virtues, and so on. It's just that maybe because the male has more physical strength, and so in the cultures which develop to a point where physical strength will transform into managerial, administrative, um, authoritative, the strength of authority. So that is set against this background. So that's my second hypothesis. The third hypothesis, what I mentioned is, again, like this is formulated against the not only the background of ancient India, but conditions on planet Earth where, which evolved under particular biological conditions where we have the class of beings called human beings who are divided into two sexes. And the statement here is made like a universal statement, like it applies to any world system, any cosmic, any galaxy in which intelligent beings evolve. And yet it's conceiving them as human beings, you know, with <laughs> divided into two sexes. But as I said, you know, as long as there are sentient beings, or intelligent sentient beings, I would say the Four Noble Truths, the three characteristics, dependent origination, can be realized. Those are the marks of a Buddha. <laughs> Maybe in other world galaxies, other world systems, the intelligent beings are not like human beings. Maybe they have two heads, eight arms, 15 legs, tails, and maybe there are three sexes amongst them, maybe four sexes, maybe each being has, is a hermaphrodite with the two sexes and one body. So, I don't know how this could be relevant in any kind of galaxy or universe that develops under, you know, very different physical and biological conditions. So, today, you wouldn't necessarily buy that. <laughs> right? In other words, a Bakuni, for example, could become head of this monastery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Can become, become the abbot, yeah, or abbess, yeah. Okay. But she can't become president. <laughs> may, may I offer an answer which has no ground, but she may like. Uh, what, what makes a woman a woman is the loving kindness to the offspring is so strong. As a woman, you keep on being a co-desirable aeon. Finally, you let that go, become a male, and rich for the whole. being a woman. I, is there any in the scripture that, that a, a Buddha never born as a female before? No, no. So, no, exactly that's the case. Yeah, yeah. So, you are male's foundation. Without you, we, we don't exist. Was there ever a story where the woman was born as a woman, or was it always a man? 
I think in the Pali Jataka stories, <laughs> he's always a male. But there, is, there are stories which sort of go back with trace the Buddha's of his lineage or past, his karmic past, beyond those in the Jataka stories. And I think in some of those it said that he was a, female, a, a woman. When they, uh, from what we understand even today, yeah. uh, today the gender is a very important factor. Yeah, yeah. We are all over the world. But I suppose in India, even fairly recently, more than the gender factor was a caste factor. Was, was a, a what? A caste. A caste factor. That is a main, in fact, Buddha spoke up against that. Yeah. And what he said against that, yeah. against the caste system, yeah. probably can be used against the gender system also, if that was visible at that time. Yeah, but, but don't forget... It was, it was like almost accepted. Yeah. In the sense that... Uh, it has, in fact, that is one thing I like about the, the oriental system, yeah. where the yin and the yang, the, they are in harmony, not in opposition. That they are together, it's part of nature. You know, it's the, yeah. the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't say one is better than the other, or bigger than the other, or even strong. I think there are a lot of ladies who are stronger than me. I'm telling you, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> physically, even physically stronger. I mean, there are like women weightlifters and um, I mean, I wrestlers. <laughs> okay. So it's a really, I, I think, it should be harmony. And I, I like that. Yeah, yeah, and I should say that there are some suttas that one does find, particularly in the Ang- in the Anguttara Nikaya, which are denigrating to women. I have to say I can't, I don't believe that those were spoken by the Buddha, even though they're as- ascribed to the Buddha. I have to say because the Anguttara Nikaya is a collection of very short, or at least many short suttas, and it would just be very easy for. Misogy- misogynistic monks. But it's fair to think yeah. that if one is called enlightened, that one would feel that when it happens. So I well, I don't think th- I don't think that feeling, that kind of denigrating feeling, comes from the Buddha himself. That's what I'm, so I'm willing to accept your reason number yeah. two. That, yeah. Yeah. You know, but throughout literature, I mean, religion, <coughs> right? That Eve is portrayed as evil, also, and. Uh, I don't know, where, where can we even find anywhere? Uh, Indira Gandhi. Uh, where can we find anywhere? Oh, yeah, Indira Gandhi, that is, I said that I couldn't think of a powerful, <laughs> a powerful woman. And Mother Teresa, but she's not powerful. Thing. Well, she's not, she's lived in India, but she's not Indian. Yeah. Um, but I was talking about, not the modern times, but up to modern times. Anyway, I'm willing to buy your second reason. So, uh, we can move on. <laughs> because it's just, it's just one of the things that disturbed me since fifth grade. I can't tell you mm. how disturbing. I mean, men are always threatened by powerful women, and they tend to denigrate them in ways that... Yeah, I mean, that's, that could be the case. Yeah, That would certainly explain, as I said... The sut- these short suttas and the Anguttara Nikaya, which are denigrating to women. But, again, I don't find that this passage is denigrating to women at all. Because also, don't forget, it's also said here that it's impossible for the woman to become Mara, the chief of the evil ones. So it's chiefdom or authority rather than Wisdom or virtue, that's the defining characteristics of these four or five types of beings that are mentioned. One thing, I, I come from Sri Lanka. Yeah. And, uh, for us, I think we respect the mother and the, uh, the woman so, very much so. I mean, for us, it is uh, maybe even more than the father sometimes, you know, because she's the one who brought it up. Yeah. So and not only that, but Sri Lanka, I think it might be the first country, or at least one of the first, that had a woman prime minister. Who wo- was the first? The Sri Mal Bandar Nayaka was in 1960s, maybe the 1950s, late 1950s even. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Gandhi, Indira Gandhi came in after Nehru died. It would be after 65 or so. Yeah. And then... Indonesia had a female 
Yeah, yeah. And then there was gold in my hair, but yeah, that's also natural. But even Sri Lanka has had queens. I mean, suppose in Delhi, the history of Sri Lanka, they have had a number of queens. Queens who were the rulers of the country, country. not the king. Not the king. king. The queen was a ruler. This I didn't know about. And sometimes it's not part of the drama. Apparently, sometimes the the queen becomes the king. Oh, that (laughs) should be not not remarkable at all. That should be quite. (laughs) Okay, we're getting a little late. Maybe we take one more question, if anybody has an urgent question or comment. Whether you consider yourself an elephant, a tiger. I can ask one more. Okay. Well, my one more question would be, I, I guess the man's name was Mogalana. Yeah. Uh, he killed tons and millions of people, right? Oh, no, no, you're thinking of Angul- Angulimala. What's his name? Angulimala. The one with the... Yeah, with the n- necklace of bombs. Yeah. Yeah. And you had said that no matter how, you know, if you've done really bad stuff, no matter how good you were after, you could never really... You had to go to the hell realm. You couldn't... I don't think I said that. You didn't say that? No. What I said is that somebody who has done a lot of good deeds might have done some bad deeds and the, one of those bad deeds might have be, be, take on the role of determining the rebirth. And so it could be that that bad deed, that he's reborn in the lower realm as a result of that bad deed. But I said that the good deeds are not lost. The good karma is not lost. That will eventually mature and bring its results. But I didn't... In his lifetime, didn't he become a bodhisattva without ever dying? He became an arahat. An arahat. And so he was liberated from birth and death. Even though he had done, before, his, before he encountered the Buddha, he had done a lot of, he had killed a lot of people, it said. Not thousands and millions, but... Well, I mean, but I know it was a horrible thing that he did. Yeah. Um, but in this case, because he transformed, that bad karma that was due to ripen in this life, ripen in the sense, in the form that he got beaten and abused when he went on alms round. People threw stones at him and hit him with sticks. They, somebody recognized him. Yeah, he got, he got beaten. Then he came running to the, or he came to the Buddha with his head bleeding and bruises all over the body. And then the Buddha said, bear it, bear it. This is, if you had not attained our hardship, something like that, you would have had, had to suffer from that karma in hell for a long, long time. But now this is the way that karma is coming back to you. Uh, okay. Now it makes more sense. Yeah. Today, yeah. Right? I was newer at this than, than I am. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, just... There's a background to that story too, I believe. He was not born that day as a hateful person. No. His teacher... His teacher... Yeah, yeah, that's the background story. Yeah. He was actually from the Brahmin class, so he would have been well brought up. Okay, I think we'll have to end for the day, because there'll be another group coming in at 1.30. Okay, we just, no, we don't do the sharing. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. We don't do the... <laughs> and when I said about president of this, I was only joking, because I'm the president. <laughs> but maybe after I'm finished, maybe... A woman, maybe a, a, one of the nuns. Maybe now she's a young nun. Maybe she gets Just older or experienced. Now. Yeah, possible. Okay, so we end just with three half bows to the Buddha.